Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark up the iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I will wait on the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits on the Lord more than watchmen in the morning. More than watchmen in the morning. O Israel, O Dorcas Little Memorial Baptist Church in Trinity, Texas, hope in the Lord. For the Lord your God. With him there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. He will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. You know, a lot of you are right there where this scripture is. There's things that you're waiting on. There's this this prayer, this scripture is right where you are. And I know that you're facing many things, and and God's just you in a place where you just completely have to trust in Him. And I just hope that the words from the psalm and this word uh, just encourage you.
Or, or maybe you get somewhere and you can't remember why you went to that place. I think one of the worst things is when we see someone, perhaps we haven't seen them a lot loud, you know them, but you can't pull their name. It's embarrassing, isn't it? Well, so Paul writes to Timothy and to us the importance of remembering. In verse 8, he says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Amen. Well, Paul writes this second letter to Timothy from prison. He's in prison in Rome. And in the letter, Paul gives Timothy this bold, clear call to continue the gospel. Even though Timothy might be suffering some, even through Paul's suffering, he says, share the gospel boldly. Several people have abandoned Paul while he is in prison. And even some of his close friends, they're out sharing the gospel, so they're distant from him. He is missing these people. And in his time, Paul has some great memories of Timothy, how Timothy was so sincere, how Timothy was devoted. And that was, that's touching us to see that Paul took notice of Timothy's ministry. If you read through the whole second book of Timothy, in chapter 4, we have this well, that well-known passage. Paul speaks of running the race well, but it is time for his departure. He knows that his death is, is imminent, his execution will come. And he urges Timothy to stand firm, but also to come see me. And he says, when you come, bring to me my books and my parchment so I can continue studying, so I can continue writing, and as long as the Lord gives me that time, to do such. This letter to Timothy is a personal letter. You can say that it is between close friends, close co-workers. And Paul encourages Timothy to continue to be faithful in his efforts to share the gospel, just like Paul was doing. He doesn't say, do what I tell you. He says, do what I am doing. Be consistent in it. And he calls Timothy to do that. Important for us to know, think about where Paul is writing from. He's writing from prison. And in a, in a sense, he was writing from at least partial isolation. Now, we've heard that word a lot in the last nine or ten weeks. <coughs> Isolate the distance. Paul, even though he still had an influence, he was isolated to some extent. He wasn't doing the things that he wanted to do. Today's message is to encourage us just to remember, even though we're doing things differently, we still have a job to do. Amen? Amen. We still have work to do right. for the Lord. Things have changed dramatically since March. But the gospel continues to be shared here in Dorcas Wills. Ministry is continuing. Amen. The church is the bride of Jesus. Right? Amen. The church is the bride of Jesus. The church continues because the church is important to God. What is God's preferred way of sharing the gospel? It is through the church. Through the, and you are the church, in fact. So you're the bride of Christ here at Trinity. His preferred way of sharing the gospel is through each one of us sharing with other people. We are his church. What can we learn for this day? What can we learn from the words that Paul shares with Timothy? Let's look at three things. First is this. Suffering is a part of the Christian experience. We see that in verse 3. What is the Christian perspective on suffering? You know, I've heard people, Christians, in fact, they believe that once you are a Christian, you will never face any hardship. You've heard people say that? It's not true, is it? You will still have hardships. There are some things, though, as a Christian that you will never face because you are walking in the path that God has for you. But let me give you an example. Even in our day right now, we had a, we had a hailstorm, tornado, another hailstorm. How many of you have cars that got banged up? But you're a Christian. You have to deal with all that inconvenience. What about your roof? Did anybody have roof damage? Yeah, we did. I was I, I laughed a bit. I guess I need to stay next to the mic. No. It's not, Go ahead. It, it helps me. I can hear oh, me. okay. The uh, we had two cars damaged. We had our roof damaged, and in the midst of it, 
not because of the storm, but our air conditioner went out. So we were two weeks without air conditioning. Some of these 90 degree days, a few of them at least, we had no air. And, and you can feel very pitiful, very miserable about yourself. But then you begin to think, I have a car to drive. I have a roof over my head. And one day I will have air conditioning again. I already have a bag, believe me. And it is so nice that there are things in the midst of even our trials to be thankful for. What would Paul say to us? If you have your Bible still open, I'm going to share some, some verses from chapter 1, but then also in chapter 2. In verse 8 of chapter 1, he says, Share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. In verse 12, he says, I am suffering because I am a teacher and preacher of the gospel. And then in verse 3 of chapter 2, we are called in our suffering to be what? To be a good soldier. We can't expect some of the same trials that, is, that are going on around us. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you escape them. But what we face, we are to face as good soldiers. Not groaning, not moaning, but facing trials in stride as we model the peace that comes from having a relationship with Jesus. I love to play golf. And on the golf course, I am quite prone to hitting bad shots. And I believe that anybody who plays golf, you will hit bad shots from time to time. Well, we've got a little saying going on in our group right now. When you hit a bad shot, they will say, Stop your murmuring. Stop your murmuring. In other words, don't complain about that bad shot. If you're not in the water, you can hit it again. If you're not in a sand trap or something, you don't have that trouble to face. Stop your murmuring. The bottom line is this. You're playing a game. Stop your murmuring. The Bible records for us. Paul was, had been beaten. Paul had been shipwrecked. Paul had been attacked. Paul had been imprisoned, and so much more for the sake of the gospel. Yes, Christians will face suffering. In this day, like everyone else, we're dealing with demands brought on by the potentially deadly impact of the pandemic. And, and we, we see that around us. There are people, we may or may not know someone personally who has died from the COVID-19 virus. I do happen to know someone. And some of you may or may not. But we are shopping differently. We're either shopping at all. Some people have gotten online and even their groceries are delivered to their homes. We are doing school differently. Suzanne and two girls, my two girls, are in Virginia right now. Jenna came home from Virginia from William & Mary first week of March. Never went back. It's like many years. You came home from high school or middle school or elementary school and you never went back. School is different. We are traveling differently. We're doing church obviously differently. We're even burying our dead differently. And I think that in one way is one of the saddest things that people are facing as they have a loved one who is gone. And, and I've heard people, I can't even go to the funeral because there's not enough room for us to get together. I will tell you this. I know that one day there will be a great coming together once again. These who have passed away during this time, we will celebrate when we unite with them in heaven. And we, we need to hold on to such thoughts and promises from Scripture as that. We also need to be reminded, as James speaks to us in chapter 1 of, of his book to us, verse 3, that the testing of our faith develops perseverance. And these trials that we're going through are developing us and shaping us. I heard this morning on the radio, the radio announcer talking to the 2020 graduates and how different it has been. And, and he reminded them, many of them were born right when 9-11 took place. So their lives, they came into the world at a tumultuous time, and you're graduating from high school, and this time it is so different. But you're being shaped for ministry and things that God would have you to do. Now, I want to share another verse. Jesus speaks to us in John 16, verse 33. He says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. That's great, right? Listen to the rest. In the world you have tribulation. 
not so great. But go back to his last words, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I'd like to switch it around in the order of the reading, saying, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have what? Peace. Yes, the world is full of tribulation, but in Jesus we will have peace. We live in a fallen world. That's, no new, that's not new news. It's, we live in a fallen world. And may our attitude be that of a good soldier as we deal with changes that we may or may not agree with or upon us. And, and, and really out of respect to others, we do some things just to for, for their good, for the good of our brother, our sister. C.S. Lewis described how he reflected a lot on what happens when secondary things become primary. And he wrote a letter in 1951 to Don B. Griffiths. And in this letter, Lewis stated the principle very clear, very succinctly for us. He said, put first things first, and we get second things thrown in. That's a good thing. Put first things first, and the second things will fall into place. But then he added, put second things first, and we lose both first and second things. If there's one thing that a soldier, go back inside of the soldier, if there's one thing that a soldier must have, that is the freedom to respond, the freedom when he hears his commander's voice to be focused on it and to go forward in it. No good soldier says to his commanding officer, sorry, I'm busy right now. No soldier says to his commanding officer, I'm watching The Bachelor. I'm watching the baseball game. I'm watching reruns of Friends. They don't say that when the commander speaks. They go, no, a soldier is always aware that they have given themselves to something that defines their priority. Think about that. You are a soldier of Jesus Christ, and that should define all your priorities. There should be no conflict. Suffering is a part of the Christian experience. We can't run from it. Because if we run from it, we may find ourselves running away from what God wants to accomplish through that testing of our faith. Number two, what do we do? What do we do? The Christian response to suffering is steady faith by God's power. Again, back in chapter 1, the one verse, how did Paul respond to suffering? How was he able to remain steady? Verse 8, he says, by the grace, excuse me, by the power of God. In verse 1 of chapter 2, strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Then in verses 11 through 13, I read just the first part. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. Paul was strengthened by the power of God. Paul was encouraged by the promises of God's faithfulness. And we can be too. Amen? How, how shall we respond as individuals and as a church? We are certainly called to be respecters of the authorities that are set above us. We are to pray for them, for their wisdom. But we're to fall in line. Going back again to the idea that your actions impact other people. And your respect to, so say, even the CDC guidelines can make someone else feel comfortable to come and to worship. However, we should not allow unfamiliar fears or laziness to keep us from the work of God. And I think the laziness is, is a key. I have heard even from my own family, oh, God forbid, but even from my own family, you know, it sure is nice watching church in my pajamas. <laughs> you know, and, that, and, and that, we, we get this, okay, we get up, we get a cup of coffee, and we go in, it's almost 10 o'clock, and when we're doing the 10 o'clock live stream, it's time to tune in to watch church. Well, there's something greatly wrong with that, because church is not to be watched. You are the church. Right. The church is you, and, and instead of watching, you are becoming 
God's church in your doing, in your answer to call, answering the call to ministry. So we can't just watch. We need to be together for the encouragement. We need to be together unified to work. Let me, let me tell you a great story about someone who was not afraid to work. The man's name was John Brown Gordon. He was a Civil War Confederate General. Robert E. Lee said of him, he was one of my best brigadiers. And he said this about John Gordon. I characterized him by a splendid audacity. Maybe it was this audacity, our courage in the heat of battle, that led John Brown Gordon to be one of the most frequently wounded Confederate soldiers, Confederate officers during the war. He was wounded in several battles and over, over his time of service. Let me read to you what, what Wikipedia says about this John Gordon. He says, first, or, or the, the scripture says this, first, a mini ball passed through his cap. This was at the Battle of Antietam in Maryland. So first, his mini ball passes through his cap. Then a second ball hit him higher in the same leg. Then a third ball went through his left arm. He continued to lead his men despite the fact that the muscles and tendons in his arm were mangled and a small artery had been severed. A fourth ball hit him in his shoulder. He continued on. His men were pleading with him, Come, fall to the back, fall to the back. But he continued to lead his men. He was finally stopped when a ball hit him in his face. It passed through his left cheek and out of his jaw, and he fell forward, his face in his cap, and he might have drowned in his own blood had, he, had the blood not drained out by bullet holes through the cap itself. A Confederate doctor was working on him, thought he wouldn't survive, but he was nursed back to health by his wife. And several months later, recuper after recuperating from his wounds, he returned, no doubt, no question that, this is the type of man he was, he returned to lead his troops and was wounded several times again before the end of the war, two and a half years later. Well, that's not even the end of the story. That's pretty spectacular, isn't it? That's not the end of the story. After the war, of course, the southern states were restored. And they were given the opportunity to have representation in the government. His name came up. He was suggested to be a senator from the state of Georgia. But there was great opposition to that, in particular one man who had fought the same war under, under, under him, under Gordon. And this man was against everything that Gordon was for. He was angry because of an old political disagreement. And he was determined to see that Gordon would be defeated. And everyone knew that he would go to whatever end he could to see that Gordon was defeated. So, the time comes to cast votes. This man very angrily stomps down the aisle with his anti-Gordon vote in hand. And as he approached the platform, he looked over to see where Gordon was sitting. And, and, and the write-up records he looked at what was Gordon Buck's very handsome face, and he saw a face that had been scarred from that. It was evidence of Gordon's willingness to suffer and bleed for the cause that he believed in. And despite the anger in his politician, he was an old soldier himself. He couldn't control his emotions. He burst into tears, and he exclaimed, It's no use. I can't do it. I cast my vote for John Gordon. And then he turned to face the surprised general, and he said, forgive me, sir. I had forgotten the scars. The Christian response to suffering is steady faith by God's power. I think this story is so powerful. There are times when we're not so steady that we just need to look at our Jesus and say to Jesus, I'm sorry, Jesus. God, the scars, and we continue to move in his power and strength to serve. Number three, the gospel is the basis for Christian endurance. Here's the bottom line for us. Chapter 1, verse 9. We've been saved to a holy calling. That is to in ministry, each one of us as individuals. Verse 10, chapter 1. Death has been abolished. Life and immortality have been given through Jesus. 
In verse 8 of chapter 2, Jesus has been raised from the dead. Verse 10 of chapter 2, we are called to endure so that we may encourage others and help to lead them to the Lord. And I skipped over one thing. I believe it is the great news of this passage and a truth spoken by Paul. In verse 9, Paul begins to speak, or are speaking, and he talks about being in prison. He says, I am bound by chains. But look at the end of the verse. I am bound by chains, but the gospel is not bound. The word of God is not bound. I want you to realize, I, I realize just like you, we have been bound so to speak by the limitations placed on us for meeting, but the gospel and the word of God have not been bound. The preaching and teaching of God's word has not been bound. Incidentally, we are live streaming today. We continue to do that. We started that at the end of March, and on many weeks, our reach has been doubled, sometimes as much as quadruple. And that's a great thing that God is doing. Why have we had to come together? Perhaps because there was someone who wasn't coming at all who was not hearing the word of God and they needed to hear the word of God. The word of God has not been down. The worship and praise of God has not ceased to have been heard each week as we come together. We are joining together as Mark leads us and some others who are volunteering to lead us to praise and lift up our voices to God. The worship and praise of God has not ceased. The ministry to God's people has not stopped. It continues on. The evangelization of lost souls has not come to an end. The prayers of God's people continue to be lifted up, and I assure you, they are heard by God. The work of God in the hearts of his people is marching forward. We know the song, Onward Christian Soldier. It continues to go forth, and we are called to be a part of that. Let me give you one more history story. It was the year 1519, and Hernan Cortez and some 600 Spaniards, probably 16 or so horses, 11 boats, landed on a vast inland plateau called Mexico. And their goal, this conquistador's men, they were about to try to conquer the area. It was a very wealthy area, great riches there of gold and of silver and even precious jewels. Their motives were not pure, their morals probably not pure, but there was something unique that unfolded in this process. Outnumbered and weak in force, most people would look have looked on what Cortez was trying to accomplish and say, only a man with a death wish would try to take this on. Adding to this whole picture of, of this undertaking was an insurmountable fact that for over 600 years, many conquerors had tried with resources far greater than what Cortez had, and they all failed. Hernan Cortez was well aware of that fact, and it was for that reason that he took a different approach as he tried to conquer the land. And instead of charging through cities and forcing his men into immediate battle, Cortez stayed on the beach and he awoke the souls of his men with melodious cadences. In other words, he gave speeches to them, and blazing speeches that pumping them up and challenging them to do his work. Ironically, it would be just three words which Cortez murmured that would change the history of the world as he and his men prepared to go inland to face the enemies. Cortez gave the order, burn the boats. When you think about that. Burn the boats. And you can imagine what each of these men thought. Even if they were afraid, even if they were facing defeat, there was nowhere for them to go except forward to continue fighting and to accomplish. They would then be all in. And the result, there were only a small army, but they were the only ones in 600 years to successfully conquer Mexico. I wonder if some of us find that fear is controlling our lives more than faith. I wonder if it's because we've never really committed. I wonder if it's because that we are 
running our lives in an omega sense. We've got a backup plan, and that makes us ready to back up. We need to say within our hearts, hear from God, earn the boat. Earn the boat. Enjoy in what I want to accomplish. We need to cross that point of no return. Be encouraged today by the sufficiency, sufficiency of the unchanging gospel, but also get back, get involved in the capacity that God would have you to work. There is something for you to do, even in these days. Won't you do it? Let's stand and pray today. Lord, we are grateful for your word. We thank you for our chance to come together. We thank you for those who joined us through live stream and maybe watching the replay at another time. But I pray for each one of us, again, that those words would really be a call to us. Burn the boat. Let go of things that distract. Let go of things that make us comfortable. Let go of things that divide our attention. Let us be focused on hearing the voice of God in His clear direction. Lord, I pray today that as we come to you, that it may be that some of us are, are needing to say, Lord, I, I failed you, and I'm not serving you the way that I should be serving you. Some may come saying, Lord, I have never even invited you into my life. I don't have a relationship with you, and I'm ready to do that. If that describes you, won't you join me in praying, dear Lord Jesus, I know that I have sinned. I am walking my path, not your path. But Lord, please forgive me. Come into my heart and shape my steps, direct my path, that I may begin living for you and being used by you. If you pray that prayer, do not keep it secret. But slip out in just a moment, share it with Brother Sam or with me or some other believer. We want to know what God is doing in your life. Lord, if there's anyone here that you've led to make a decision, we pray for your spirit to rest on them, giving them courage to make it public. And Lord, I pray for those who are watching on live stream or the replay later on, that they too would hear your voice and respond. And that they would reach out to this church and let us know that God is doing something in their lives. Lord, we pray for your spirit to move now in our hearts. Thank you for the day. We pray in Jesus' name. We will have an opportunity to respond a little bit different than normally, but if you have a decision to make or need prayer or counseling, if you would step forward, we're going to go downstairs to a counseling room that's a little bit bigger where we can be together but be spread, spread out to a good distance. Sam will be here to lead you down, and I've also asked others to be there to help in that counseling effort if there's anyone here needing that encouragement. From the Mark. There you go. Sing her again. I
said. Amen. May God bless each of you as you go out this week. And I know we're trying to play in line with distancing as we go out. And so you guys know the rules. Thank you for being here. We'll see you Wednesday during our live stream for prayer meeting. And hope to see you back next week. You are dismissed. I'm still playing. I'm not. I forgot to start it and then I forgot to stop it. <laughs>